Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the SBK Saturday Night Selections. A big field to look forward to today and some news and notes as well to be mentioning throughout the course of the podcast. So it's going to be fairly action-packed in the next 20 to 25 minutes. As always, uh, my name is Luke Elder and uh, sitting just kind of next to me on your screen is Tom Collins. Tom, how are you doing? Morning, Luke. Yeah, yeah, I'm all good. I'm looking forward to covering a big field this weekend. Obviously, uh, we're, we're looking at the Belmont Derby, as you'll see by the headline and the title of this video. But the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at four or five runner contests, generally with short price favourites. We've had some luck, but I mean, tipping up a one to two or one to five, if you're betting in the US uh, winner last week, doesn't really count for much. So this week, hopefully we'll find a value play um, and hopefully get punts on the board as well. Yeah, absolutely. And... We've got UK interest this week to look forward to as as well. Three uh, UK horses, to be uh, precise, are going over uh, to America. There are also some uh, running on the undercard, if you will, at uh, Belmont on the other day. So there is plenty to look forward to regarding UK interest at Belmont. But our focus is going to be on the Belmont derby. We'll get to that in a few moments uh, time. Don't forget, you can listen to this uh, podcast on well, anywhere you get your podcasts uh, and also on YouTube as well. Comment, subscribe to SBK, uh, do the whole lot so you get notified when we put up a new episode. If not, every Friday, pretty much it goes up and you can listen uh, before the Saturday action. But last week, uh, Tom, uh, the John Aina Rude Stakes, life is good, was life is good. Yeah, it was a glittering performance. This is what we wanted to see. As I say, he went off at one to five in the US. Um, He was a bit bigger over here, but still very skinny odds. But he deserved to be. um, It was domination from the outset. The only worry we had going into the race was whether he'd be 100% fit off a layoff. Last seen, of course, in the Dubai World Cup at Maidan back in March. That was no worry whatsoever. He broke like a bullet as per is what we always see from life is good. And he just romped from the outset. Speaker's Corner tried to push him early and fair play to the horse and to Bill Mott for entering Speaker's Corner into the event. But he was just not not a match for Life is Good. Like he wasn't a match for Flight Line in their previous start as well. Um, it was a good effort. They didn't go too hard early on. Life is Good actually went faster through the half uh, in the Breeders' Cup mile last year than he did in the John A. Nay route over a shorter trip. But he was just powerful in the straight, moved clear. He could be nine for nine in his career if things just dropped right in two of his previous races. Instead, he's seven for nine. Interesting to see where they go next, whether it's the Breeders' Cup mile again or if it's the Classic. Mm one run between then potentially yeah i imagine so uh, yeah. they'll want to give him another spin probably over the mile and a quarter trip yeah. again just to test um the distance because he didn't seem to stay in the dubai world cup and obviously we're yet to see flight line try the trip as well so i think there's two big prep races coming up for two of the best horses in the world and obviously in the u.s um life is good will probably come out in a couple of months time and we'll see eventually where they're going to go at the breeders cup yeah why wait to the breeders cup Run them against each other now. We're absolutely fine. We're all for uh, that. But yeah, life is good. Was was very good uh, last week at uh, Belmont. Just before we move on to the Belmont Derby, because that race take no talking about whatsoever. Just a couple of news and notes. Uh, Joseph O'Brien announcing uh, in the last week or two that he's going to set up a satellite yard over at Saratoga. Uh, don't know what horses he might send over there or which horses he might purchase over in in the US. But this is this is really interesting news. Yeah, huge news. Um, he has a few horses with China Horse Club and. He's got other horses with owners that have runners in the US as well. So not com- not a complete shock, but also it's a first. Joe O'Brien's never set up a satellite yard in the US. The prize money over there is incredible. Saratoga is one of the best meets in the world and there's plenty of turf races. So it's ideal for Joe O'Brien to send some horses over there, compete for these huge funds, and I'm sure he's going to be successful. Last year, he sent over Baron Samedi, State of Rest. Um, there was a couple more as well, but those two were successful. And I fully expect him and rider John Velasquez, who he tends to book for his horses, to have another successful summer at Saratoga. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure he's going to be training them per se, but someone's got to overlook and run the yard. But um, I haven't seen on that part. But obviously, Joseph will be running the rule over the yard at the very least. But obviously, he's still got his commitments back in in Ireland. But um, anything else, news and notes wise? That was the, the kind of main talking point, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the main talking point. I mean, we've touched on Saratoga coming up, but generally, if you you love US racing, there is no better meeting, not only just for the neutral and who wants to watch good quality racing, but also for the punter. There tends to be value across a load of different races, bigger fields than we've seen at Belmont uh, so far this spring and early summer. So do keep focused on on Saratoga. Uh, The countdown's on. It's only a week and a bit away now. Um, Belmont actually ends this weekend. So Saratoga will pick up right off the back of that. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure you are too. Yeah, absolutely. Just like when Santa Anita ended, like for like, Belmont went to Saratoga, Santa Anita went to the Los Alamitos. 
<laughs> yeah, just like for like, as you say, um, mm -hmm. going from one of the best tracks in Santa Anita to uh, not one of our favourites. Probably the worst track in North America. Yeah, it's up there. It's up there, especially for pun for punting. That long straight just gives me nightmares. <laughs> Uh, Belmont Derby upcoming. Um, what we're going to do? We're going to do like a, a quick fire uh, runner by runner in the, the Belmont Derby this week because, uh, as we said, Tom, we've actually got quite a few runners to talk about this week, which is something we're not used to. Yeah, big field, thirteen runners. We've been covering four and five runner races, and this week, I mean, the morning line suggests the favourite could be anyone. If you're looking at the UK odds right now, then obviously not. They've come down on the horse who will come to last in this runner by runner, but. Uh, the morning line suggests it could be three, uh, four or five to one the field, which would be incredible. But um, let's get into it. Yes, whether there'll be those prices, we, we'll see. I doubt it. Uh, number one on the race card is implementation. The Pierre Brandt uh, runner coming over from France. Last time around was disappointing at uh, Chanty. That was a race where you had to be towards the uh, the four. Erevan uh, won. It was a group three contest and just never got out of last place. But the, the start before that was a decent enough effort behind Vidani. Of course, Vidani went on to win the Eclipse at Sandown just last uh, week. The form looks OK. Whether the run will suit here, I'm, I'm not sure. Number two is Stolen Base, 10 to 1. The first of the two, uh, the first of the bundle of US runners in this race represents Mike Maker. Cost $335,000 um, as a two year old. And it's just two from nine in his career. Highly tried as a juvenile last year, though. Uh, he finished second in the grade two Bourbon at Keenan, which was a good effort. And then he took seventh in the Breeze Cup juvenile turf in, in the autumn. He's built on those efforts this year, but he hasn't necessarily shown that he's up to this standard. His Churchill form last time out in the American States. Who knows what's that, what that's worth? The Churchill turf is just terrible. They've shut down that course for the whole summer. Um, who knows how, what he's going to perform in this race? I don't think he's much of a player, but he's 10 to 1 on the morning line. Yeah, it's a race that we will talk about again uh, during this runner by runner, as we will for the Pennine Ridge Stakes, uh, which was a grade one at Belmont. Uh, we actually covered this race, tomping up the winner in Emmanuel, who we'll talk about in a few moments' time. But Napoleonic War is a horse that we have also discussed uh, even away from the Pennine Ridge because he's a horse that both myself and Tom like, but he scraped home at Belmont two outings ago. He, he ran a good race in the Pennine Ridge, don't get me wrong, but he never looked like getting on top of Emmanuel. They went a slow pace that day. Not going to be the case this time around, Tom. No, and the reason for that is number four, classic causeway. He's 12 to one on the morning line, but he should be 25, 30 to one. I don't think he has much of a chance in here, but he is a key horse in this race. He's been trying dirt throughout his career. Um, he was on the Kentucky Derby Trail. He finished 11th in that race, 11th in the Florida Derby disappointed on both those starts after romping home in a couple of Kentucky Derby uh, trials at Tampa Bay, including the Tampa Bay Derby and the Sam F. Davis States. Now he tries turf for the first time. This horse is full of speed, stacks of early pace. He'll go forward. There's a number of frontrunners in this race, but I think he's the speed of the speed. Hopefully he sets decent fractions because that will really help the European horses that we're yet to cover in this runner by runner analysis. Yeah, we mentioned Napoleonic War, or I did a few moments ago. A horse that's beaten Napoleonic War in the past is Grand Sonata, who's the next on the uh, the list, uh, managed to come in front at uh, Keeneland, albeit did bump into Side Dog, who, who reopposes uh, this uh, time around. That was a good little race, albeit I just wonder if Grand Sonata is going to be good enough. Did manage to win the Kitten's Joy at uh, Gulfstream, a grade three, a couple of starts ago. This, again, is a lot, lot trickier. Yeah, number six is Machete, the second of two French runners. Luke's already covered, covered implementation. And Machete actually has the beating of that horse on two pieces of form. Uh, he won a listed event back at Shanti in March and confirmed that form again in the Prix de Guiche in May. Uh, maybe he's the best of the two French horses. And he's been behind Vadini, that looks already covered, um, who won the Eclipse last weekend. So the form line looks good, but he wasn't in Vadini's parish on both of those occasions. He's going to have to take a big step forward in this race. I don't think he's got a chance again. He's 20 to 1. Um, who knows, European challenger is probably going to dominate this race, uh, aside from one or two, so maybe he does run into a place. Yeah, the, the seven horse is Graham Motion's charge here. Manny Franco has been in great form in the saddle recently uh, in New York, taking the other ride. Uh, that's Side Dog, who I think is a bit of a runner at a price here, was third last time around in the American turf. That's the race that Tom was talking about uh, with uh, Stolen Base. Uh, did manage to stay on late in the piece. I'm just not sure that race really suited. This trip will definitely suit a lot better uh, for Side Dog. So I think he's got a better spot here. It is a trickier race, but you're being rewarded, Tom, with a bigger price if you do like him. Yeah, and you touched on Graham Motion there. Well, he will soon become the trainer of number eight, Royal Patronage, who's going to represent Charlie Mark Johnson in this race, shipping over from the UK. However, he will be staying in the US for Graham Motion uh, for the foreseeable future. This horse had a good level of form at two. He actually beat Caribus uh, in the Royal Lodge, the only horse to have beaten Caribus so far in his career. He hasn't built on that so far in, in his three-year-old season. 
He was disappointing in the derby, finished right out the back. I don't know if connections were, were slightly trying to see if he was a hold-up horse rather than going forward, and it's just not worked. Maybe he's better, better on the front end. It'll be hard to see him actually leading this race, though. Joel Rosario is booked, which is a big positive given his course knowledge. Yes, absolutely. So, and, and Tis the Bomb is a horse that we will also know, even if you are just a casual follower of American racing, because he won uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf last year, obviously, when Modern Games was taken out. For betting purposes, Tis the Bomb did manage to uh, win the race. And if he did back Tis the Bomb, you'd have been paid out as a winner. But they tried to turn him into a Kentucky Derby horse this year. He, he ran a Gulfstream in the, whole, uh, in the Holy Bull. He didn't really run all that well. He went to Turfway Park after that and uh, managed to, to win a couple of races. Some places will tell you that Durfway Park is is a dirt track it's a synthetic track to Peter that's why Tis the Bomb was was good there did actually beat Rich Strike and then finished ninth in the in the derby interested to see him back on turf but he's a fascinating runner Tom I'm finding it hard to place him though yeah he is he'll be well fancied in the betting as will number 10 which is Nation's Pride the sole Charlie Appleby entrant in this field Charlie Appleby has a phenomenal record with grade one horses over in the US in the last five years 12 from 25 in grade ones Phenomenal, 48% strike rate. And if you look just in the last couple of years, he's over 50%. So you can't sleep on this horse. He's four from six in his career. Frankie the Tory's taking the journey over to New York to ride, which I think is a, a key booking given how Frankie rode a couple of winners last year for, for Appleby in Canada and the US. Nation's Pride has to bounce back from a derby defeat, much like Royal Patronage. But he actually ran OK at Epsom. I definitely wouldn't be sleeping on him. I think he's a leading player in this race. Yeah, he'll be one of the more fancied runners in the, the market. Maybe not for the next horse, who could be overlooked. So the 11 is Emmanuel, who Tom did tip last time around uh, when winning the, uh, the Pennine Ridge. We mentioned that race a few times, and we're going to mention it again in a, a few moments. Napoleonic War coming out of that, uh, that race. Managed to get a really, really soft lead uh, on that occasion. That's the reason Emmanuel managed to win. That's the reason Tom went for Emmanuel uh, as well. Not going to be the case here. He's a very classy horse, but things are not going to go his way this time around. No, he won that decisively. Back in third in that race was Limited Liability, who's the number number 12 in the Belmont Derby. He's 12 to 1 on the morning line, but it looks like you're going to get a, a bit bigger price over here with our firms, which is a gift, in my opinion, and, and hopefully Luke's will see shortly. Uh, this, this is the son of Kitten's Joy. Should appreciate the stretch out and trip to a mile and a quarter. Has been running over shorter distances in small fields, not getting the ideal pace scenario, and has just been closing off to finish, you know, third, fourth, whatever. Two runs back at Keeneland, really impressive when he actually had pace to chase. I think he's a leading player and shouldn't be overlooked. Mm -hmm. And the, the last one uh, on the, uh, the card is the 13. I always cover more horses than Tom. It doesn't <laughs> matter if it's a big field or a small field. I always do more work than Tom. But Stone Age is the last one. I don't mind talking about him. Uh, he's potentially going to be your race time favourite. He, he's going to be at least one of the more fancied runners uh, for Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien. Uh, Stall 13, little bit of a nightmare for a horse that wants to go forward. That's not exactly our ideal, but did run a decent sixth in the, the derby. I'm not really sure a mile and a half is, is 100% his trip. So the drop back to 10 furlongs will, um, will suit and We'll find out here if Stone Age is, is good enough. Bolshoi Ballet won this race 12 months ago. This is, a like I said, a tricky contest, but Stone Age will go straight into the preview, Tom, because he's the, 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 the decent starting point. This time last week, we sat here saying if he gets a lead, then Stone Age will be pretty tough to stop. However, I did not expect 12 other runners to be lining up yeah. in this. I mean, exactly that. I didn't expect a big field, and not only that, but I didn't expect Classic Causeway to also be in the lineup, and that's going to really hinder Stone Age's chance. The ability for him to get to the front and showcase what he did back at Leopardstown in his derby trial before going to Epsom, just getting to the front, dictating matters, kicking clear, that's not going to happen here. He doesn't have the gate speed of Classic Causeway. He doesn't have the early pace of Classic Causeway. And there are a couple of other front runners in this field, which suggests he may even be held out wide from that um, unfavorable post in gate 13. I think he will go forward. I think he'll be in an okay position, but I don't think he's going to be good enough. And even if he is, I definitely don't want to be taking that short price on him. Yeah, whenever I see Ryan Moore on a, on a wide-drawn horse over in the US, I always think hit it a bomb. He won the juvenile turf mm. at Keeneland. But if they try and ride Stone Age like that, he's not going to be winning this. No, I mean, not only does he have to improve on his efforts so far to win this race, albeit against a group of US horses who probably aren't up to the calibre that you know he faced Epsom or whatnot, but he's going to have to negotiate the draw. And just, if you're taking a short price on this horse, you, there is plenty you need to go right. And as a punter, when you're looking at risks v rewards, there are too many risks in here to actually think there's a reward from that price. Yeah, me, me and Tom were talking about Stone Age this morning and last night and 
a few days ago as well. Uh, we have a life. Um, <laughs> he, we, we sort of said five to two, 11 to four, fair enough. I've seen one firm have gone six to four, which is one of the worst prices I've seen on a horse ever. Yeah, that's an absolutely miserable price. There's no way he'll be six to four with SBK. We're just currently waiting for prices, uh, but he will be bigger if you do fancy Stone Age. If he does go off six to four, he's probably the lay of the week because that's just horrendous value in a race where you can make a case for five, six, or maybe even seven horses. Yeah, I thought I clicked onto the place market accidentally earlier on with that firm, but six to four is bad. Um, we'll mention, we'll go through the three English runners uh, first, or there seem to be two English runners, but Nation's Pride is the, the next of them. I know you're quite sweet on Nation's Pride. I'm the other side of the fence. Yeah, I really do like Nation's Pride. I think he's, well, he is going to be my selection in the race. I don't think, I know he's going to be my main selection in this race. There are two, I have to say, the, the caveat is there is another pick at a bigger price, but Nation's Pride is my number one. As I say, Charlie Appleby has just dominated with these horses. He sent over four grade ones in the US and Canada in the last five years. 12 from 25, incredible strike rate. I love the fact that Frank of the Tory is going across. Some people love the Tory, some people don't like him, but there is no getting away from the fact when it comes to a group or a grade one, the Tory tends to produce. And I'm hopeful that on Nations Pride, he's going to get the ideal stalky trip. Two runs back at Newmarket, he beat Hu Yamal by seven lengths. Now, Hu Yamal is not an incredible horse. I know he finished second in the, in the Epsom Derby, but that wasn't the Hu Yamal. You know, other horses underperformed. He kind of picked up the pieces and his SP of 150 to one kind of proved that. However, he still destroyed him by seven lengths and moved clear like a really talented horse. Last time in the Derby, found, Nation's Pride found himself miles out of his ground, right out of the back, got shuffled, shuffled back through the field, going around the bend and just never really had a chance. He was six wide as well, was hanging down the camber, I just don't think we saw the real nation's pride that day. He was well found in the market. I think the return to a flatter track, which is what you're going to get at Belmont, is going to suit. A quick early pace will allow him to use his turn of foot. And he's definitely my number one selection in this race, Luke. Yeah, I, I, I do get it. I do get it. I just think he's going to need a lot of things to go right. And at the price, I don't think you're getting much sort of wiggle room uh, for, for that. It'd be around about four to one, nine to two, I'd, I'd imagine. I'm also a little bit concerned about Frankie over in the US. Recently, he's, he's not ridden the US perfectly especially when it does get a bit more crowded and, and bigger fields i go back to uh keenan was two readers cups ago he yeah. was awful he was real bad uh, at, at keenan albeit that is a track that he just doesn't really ride all that well um i, I must say that much but i, I just I, I do have a slight reserve regarding nation's pride uh, one horse that we are both very reserved about is royal patronage who i, I just can't have in this spot at all no, I can't have him. I think he's best seen on the front end um, so far this year. As I covered in the runner by runner, he's been held up out the back or in mid-division and tried to make a late run. That's just not ideal for Royal Patronage. He's not going to be able to get forward in this race. Joe Rosario himself probably won't even want to ride him forward. Knowing Rosario, he'll probably hold him up right at the back and hope for a late run. Yeah, I don't fancy him. I think Grand, Mo <laughs> I think Grand Motion will find a better spot for him uh, in, the, in the upcoming months. This isn't the ideal placement for, for Royal Patronage. Yeah, he'll do okay in America. Don't get me wrong. But... Probably not in this. Um, I'm going to make a case for you, Tom, for one at a big price, which is going to be one of my selections. You, you revealed one. We've both taken two in this race, but I've gone for two at a big price. Dog is one of them, who I still think we've got a lot to sort of learn about about Dog. Last time around, things didn't really go right. He's not really a miler. It was an extended mile, so a mile and a half a furlong on top of that. But Stolen Basin and Balnikov mainly uh, were kind of thorns in the side. Balnikov and, and Manny Franco came right around the outside of Side Dog just as he was trying to quicken. And he just didn't have the, the initial sprint effectively when, when you needed to. And then he plugged on into the third place. He shaped as if this trip will be absolutely perfect. And he'll be on the board about 20 to 1. I think that's a, I think that's a fair enough prize for, for Side Dog. I'll be, I'll be having a little bit of that. Yeah, I think you can take a shot in this race, especially if you don't like Stone Age and Nation's Pride. I think you can take a shot at a big price. He's very unexposed. Only had four starts with a leading trainer, won three of them. I mean, there are plenty of ticks inside Dog's box. I don't, I don't think he's really run to the figures that you need to win this race so far, and he will definitely need to improve, but I can see the angle there. Yeah, I think he will improve uh, as well, uh, Side Dog, but he'll be uh, one of them. We'll, we'll, we'll go for the next selection because we, we've both gone for the same one. I really didn't want to go for limited liability. However, that's because I thought limited liability would be about a six, seven to one chance. And at that price, fair enough. Yeah. I've seen him on the board at places sort of 20, 25 to one. That is wrong. Yeah, I'm completely with you. Uh, we're, as you say, we're both going to tip this horse as well as our secondary selection. Limited liability. If you're getting 20 to one, that is one of the best value bets of the week. 
and maybe he doesn't win this. Maybe he hasn't. Go on. I got I, I got twenty fives. <sighs> of course it's, he did. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still available. Still, available. I mean, twenty five to one is outstanding value in this field. Now he needs a lot to go right, but as I covered in the runner by runner, this horse just hasn't had the trip. He stays really well, and he's been running over shorter distances, and they've been going a crawl up front. In the Pennine Ridge, they went 51.72 seconds through the half. That is literally walking, and he still managed to run, run home for third behind Emmanuel. I fully expect him to reverse that form with that runner. Previously um, at Keeneland, he was super impressive, last to first. He has the burst that is similar to what you expect from European runners going to the US. I think that's a huge plus for limited liability. His draw is a slight worry. Maybe he gets shifted out wide from gate 12, but I think he's going to be held up. To be fair, being wide, and if you're held up, isn't actually a bad thing because you want that clear passage. What is crucial here, if, if for people who don't necessarily always follow US races, is that he's trained by Shug McGahey. And as I keep saying, Shug McGahey is the US, the Michael Stout. He improves his horses uh, run after run. You don't expect to see them as good two-year-olds like Wesley Ward, for example. But Shug McGahey creates these horses into brilliant three-year-olds and great older horses. He's won this race three times, 1987, 1990, and 2014. I think limited liability has been on the radar for this race for a long period of time. And at a big price, I think he's got a great chance of at least hitting the frame, but also of winning. Yeah, I agree entirely. One thing I'll add on to that as well is that he's a hold-up horse. On the inside of him, in 11, Emmanuel, he'll go forward. Nation's Pride in 10 will likely go forward. Tis the Bomb in 9 will at least be midfield. Uh, Royal Patronage yeah. in, in 8 will also likely try and go forward. I, I'd imagine they would anyway, otherwise it would be a waste of time. So he ought to be able to duck in and, and go towards the uh, the rail and then try and make a bit of ground up, sort of maybe going into the first bend or so. But I, I can see things going quite nicely for him here. And as you say, that there were, what was it, 51 and... 51.72 through the, through the half. Which Tom could run faster than that. But <laughs> it's not a case of limited liability was third off a slow pace. He was last. He, he was last and detached off that slow pace and still managed to get third. That's that's a run very much worth upgrading with um, with limited liability. I think anything double figures regarding limited liability is worth taking each way. I, I think he's got a, a phenomenal chance in this. And also Ho Jose Ortiz, uh, a big time jockey booking as well for, uh, for Shug McGahey. Uh, I'll open up the floor. Anything else that you want to mention, Tom? Not in this race. I think we covered the main players. Um, Stone Age, if he wins, then we'll be crying next week. But he's a short price anyway. So I think even if even if he does win, and people don't tend to understand this as punters, but even if he does win, he's a terrible bet. People will think, well, you're on the winner, so that's a good bet. No, he's too short a price. If you're back in Stone Age, say you run this race 10 times, mm -hmm. if you're back in Stone Age at 6-4 to four, or you know, a short price, anywhere between 6-4 to four and 2-1 to one, or 9-4, to four, um, if you if you're backing him every time, I'd probably suggest. Therefore, he's a terrible price in this race. I hope he runs well for Aiden O'Brien. I hope he runs well for Ryan Moore and Connections. But look, as long as he doesn't win and we get a good run from our selections, including limited liability, then I'll be happy this time next week. Yeah, I agree. I mean, six to four is a terrible price. 11 to four, fair enough. Like, go, go for it. If you fancy Stone Age, then yeah, sure. But six to four, don't even go near that. Um, tips for the UK racing. Yeah, you've um, you've linked into that as I was the kind of same feelings that I had when I was looking at the card uh, <laughs> for the UK events on Saturday. We, we haven't been gifted with much quality on these uh, on these pods when we're looking at the UK contest, but I have got one selection. It comes at Salisbury, and that is Suze Lay at twelve. Do you like my French there? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah just just <laughs> like tell. i'm in just like i'm in paris <laughs> <laughs> you can tell my french origins uh this is actually a pretty good race in terms of the role of honor the 715 at salisbury charger queen won it back in 2016 uh, now quickly won it last year both are around 100 horses charger queen i think ran to 108 now quickly is about 96 so we have seen some good horses in this event i think this year's renewal was up to scratch as well i think there are a couple of potential improvers in there but I'm hopeful that Sue Lay at 12 will be the number one improver for Charlie Fellows. And the fact that Roger Varian and Michael Stout have entries in the race could mean we might get a good price on this filly. Um, she's by Sea the Stars out of a fantastic light mare. There's pedigree there for the, for the taking and there's stamina throughout it as well, which suggests this triple suit. She showed great promise on her first two runs in defeat. Last time out over this course and distance, really impressive. Travelled beautifully through the race, power clear in the closing stages, despite showing signs of greenness. And a mark of 79 seems very fair. If she is a 90, 95 filly, then 
hopefully she should get this job done in the 7.15 at Salisbury. I'll give you a gold star if you can tell me what Sue Layer 12 means. Absolutely not a clue. Do you know? Give me one of the words. Um, no. Really? <laughs> yeah, my French is bad. And I did it when I was at school, albeit that was a fair while ago. That means under the stars. Very nice. Did you know that off the top of your head? Have you Googled that? I knew a 12 was star. And I, I could get le. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> Sue, I was a little bit iffy. On that. So I, I, I Googled that part, but yeah, under the stars. Um, I've gone... What time is your race? 7.15? Yes, yeah. I've gone 15 minutes after Tom with uh, Hey Zoom. Uh, Tom every week goes, right, okay, we're going to do this meeting for the UK runners. I'm like, cool, I'm going to go for the other evening meeting. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I just mess things up entirely. But I've gone for Hey Zoom in the 7.30 at, at Hamilton. Sam James taking the um, the ride was was okay the, the last uh, twice. At Pontefract last time around, didn't quite see out the trip over two mile two and at uh, Musselburgh at the time before. He was just getting going really uh, over two miles. It's a sharper track though. They're, they're complete polar opposites, Ponty and, uh, and Musselburgh. They were both Sunday series races. So for all that they're a 0 to 80 and a 0 to 85, they're very, very strong races for uh, for that sort of band effectively. This is still a 0 to 80. This is a lot weaker though. I think Hey Zoom uh, is going to be a, an interesting one it's not a strong fancy per se, but I do think Hey Zoom will will run well. I do prefer bet wise. If you're going to nail me down to a bet of the week for for the podcast, it would be limited liability over in in America. But I do think Hey Zoom will um will run well. So they're the two uh, UK horses. Uh, hey Zoom for me, Tom. Your one or your selections for the week were. Uh, so my UK runner is Sue's Leia Twal in the 7.15 at Salisbury and in the Belmont Derby, which I believe is 10.12 p.m. and will be shown live on, on Sky Sports Racing. Um, I like limited liability at double figure price, but Nation's Pride is the number one for Charlie Appleby, who's done phenomenally well in the US. Yeah, I'll take it in the, the Belmont Derby, Side Dog, and also will um, uh, take limited liability as well. And then Hey Zoom in the 7.30 at uh, Hamilton. Uh, don't forget, new SBK customers uh, deposit £10. You get £30 in free bets. That's for new SBK customers. Deposit 10 you get £30 in free bets. And hopefully, you might be able to put that on, on limited liability and get a little bit back on that uh, front. Um, Tom, thank you very much for your help today. Ne- next week, we'll, if you're here, we'll try not to agree. <laughs> Yeah, well, we seem to be agreeing a lot lately. We didn't at the start in the first few episodes, but I mean, over the course of the last five or six weeks, we've been agreeing a lot. And to be fair, we've been pretty successful. This is just in the US. We, I don't think we've agreed once in the UK uh, so far, but we have been targeting different races. I mean, Saratoga soon. So uh, I'm really excited. Hopefully I am here next week. Obviously, uh, for those listeners, my girlfriend is pregnant and we're very close to the due date. So I may not be, but if I'm not, then Luke will, uh, this pod will be in the capable hands of Luke and I'm sure he'll also. Uh, point you in the direction of a few winners yeah if it's just me on my own it'll be real boring but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we can but uh, uh tom thank you very much best of luck in the upcoming week and you you may be venturing into fatherhood but that'll be that'll be great for you it always goes really seamlessly yeah i mean hopefully the next week will be uh will be fantastic winners and everything along the way so um yeah best of luck to you too hopefully we're both celebrating limited liability coming from last person the public derby uh, thank you everyone for listening don't forget to subscribe but to uh, sbk on youtube wherever you listen to your podcast and then you'll be notified uh, of all podcasts that sbk put out uh, including this one the saturday night uh, selections you can find us wherever you get your podcasts find us on youtube uh, and uh, do uh, leave a review and also a thumbs up if you possibly could but thank you for listening this week i definitely will be back next week we're not sure about tom hopefully he will be until then have a very good week stay safe look after other goodbye